In the 1840s, an Englishman created his own private kingdom on the island of Borneo. Supported by the Royal Navy, one of whose commanders is a far-off relative to Queen Camilla, he fought the Borneo Pirates. My Harry Flashman fans might recall just such a tale, but it really did happen. This is the story of James Brooke, the White Raja of Sarawak, and the Borneo Pirates. The island of Borneo lies in the vast archipelago of Southeast Asia. Nowadays it's split between Indonesia and Malaysia, along with the tiny Sultanate of Brunei. When our story starts, however, it was the Sultan of Brunei who actually ruled a large part of the island. It was also home to the Borneo pirates. From their well-protected stockades deep up the jungle rivers in the north of the island, the pirates sailed out into the South China Sea. Their fleets, sometimes numbering over 100 vessels, called prahus, ranged from fast, sleek spy prahus through to giant war prahus, armed with cannon and capable of carrying hundreds of fighting men. Not all was well for the Sultan of Brunei. Local people, fed up with the high taxes in the Sultan's province of Sarawak to the northwest of the island, had risen in revolt. The Sultan's uncle, Raja Muda Hashim, was sent to suppress the insurrection, but to no avail. And into this melting pot arrived a young 35-year-old adventurer, James Brooke. Born in India in 1803, where his father was an East India Company judge, James Brooke had been commissioned in the 6th Bengal Native Infantry in 1819. He saw action during the First British-Burmese War in 1825, where he was wounded. A man who seemed to have a romantic spirit for adventure, Brooke eventually resigned his commission and decided to emulate his hero, Sir Stamford Raffles, founder of Singapore, and build an empire in Southeast Asia. Using part of his inheritance, he purchased the 142-ton schooner, the Royalist, and in August 1839 arrived at the port of Kuching, the main town in Sarawak. As a foreigner on a ship that boasted six six-pounder guns, he quickly came to the attention of the Sultan's uncle, Muda Hashim, who was still trying to suppress the local revolt without much success. He now asked if Brooke would assist him in providing the firepower of the Royalist. And in return, he offered the Englishman the position of Governor of Sarawak. Brooke duly bombarded the rebel fort, and having led his own crew in the ensuing attack, the rebels surrendered to him. James Brooke was installed as governor or Raja of Sarawak in 1842. The new white Raja now set about reforming his fiefdom. As a product of the evangelical Christian revival in Britain at that time, he decided that three evils needed eradicating in Sarawak. Headhunting, slavery, and piracy. Now, these last two were intertwined, the Borneo pirates, based in both Sarawak and further along the coast, were happy to plunder and trade in anything they could lay their hands on, including human beings. And it just so happened that at that time, the Royal Navy was charged by the government in London with keeping the world's oceans safe for trade and the prevention of the slave trade. Brooke sent word to Singapore asking for naval assistance against the pirates. And one captain, was only too keen to oblige, Henry Keppel. Without waiting for any authority, Keppel sailed from Singapore on the 18-gun corvette, HMS Dido, arriving in Sarawak in 1843. Apart from the Royal Navy corvette, Keppel's anti-slavery fleet consisted of just one other vessel, a ship that Brooke had built locally, the Jolly Bachelor, which was armed with a six-pound gun. Nevertheless, that was enough for young men as inspired and confident as Henry Keppel and James Brooke. They planned to attack the pirate fleet based way up the Sarabas River. Using the tidal bore, they sailed 70 miles up the Sarabas, deeper and deeper into the steaming jungles of Borneo. Cutting their way through a boom in the river, Keppel's sailors and Brooke's local Dayak fighters stormed the pirate stockade. As most of the pirates had already fled, the victors had to satisfy themselves with burning down the stockade and the nearby ships. But before they could continue their campaign, Keppel was ordered to Hong Kong. 
But he returned the following year, 1844, this time accompanied by the East India Company steamer, Phlegathon. Their next target, the pirates on the Skrang River, led by a local nobleman, Serif Saib, proved a tougher nut to crack. Their first setback was when the leading spy prowl, captained by one of Brooks' key local officers, Patinga Ali, was ambushed by six vessels. With a felled tree cutting off his retreat, Patinga Ali stood no chance as his small vessel was engulfed by up to 600 pirates. However, Keppel was now aware of the pirate positions, which he proceeded to bombard before sending in his cutlass-wielding blue jackets. They were joined by Brooks Dyak warriors, armed with deadly blowpipes. Incidentally, they and the British soldiers were facing similar blowpipes, firing at them too. In a bloody battle, Keppel lost three officers, whilst Brooke lost 30 of his men killed and 56 wounded. In and around the stockade, however, lay hundreds of dead pirates. But James Brooke's mission against the pirates was far from over. In August 1846, Admiral Sir Thomas Cochrane arrived off the north coast of Borneo with a squadron of eight ships. Cousin to the more famous Admiral Lord Cochrane, the inspiration for the Master and Commander stories, he'd been in the Royal Navy for over 40 years and had been present at the burning of Washington during the War of 1812. His mission here in Borneo was to rescue two Lasker seamen seized by pirates from a British registered ship. Joined by Brooke, he set sail for Maradu Bay on the northeast tip of the island. Their target? The pirate leader, Serif Osman, whom Brooke informed Cochrane was holding the two captives. But there may have been another agenda at play here. Brooke believed that Osman was in league with what he called the pirate faction at the Sultan's court. Now, whilst that faction were sympathetic to, and maybe have even benefited from, the traditional Borneo trade of piracy, they were also opposed to Brooke. And it just so happened that the popular Serif Osman was increasing his influence in the Sultan's court, just as Brooke was trying to increase his too. So maybe he was a pirate, or maybe he was simply a political rival to Brooke. Either way, his elimination was in the White Raj's interest. Anchoring his fleet in Marudu Bay, Cochrane sent a flotilla of 20 small, smaller Dayak craft plus some Royal Navy rowing boats up a nearby river to seek out Serif Osman's base. After 10 miles, they found their way blocked by a double boom in the river, consisting of giant tree chunks bolted together with iron plates. Under crossfire from cannon mounted on war parus and eight guns in a stockade overlooking the river, they eventually managed to force a gap in the boom. Then the mixed force of 450 men, including Brooks' teenage nephew, Charles Johnson, stormed the stockade, losing 10 men in the process. Upon entering, they found that most of Osman's men had fled, as had their leader. What they did find was a treasure trove of goods from all around Southeast Asia. There was even an ornate ship's bell inscribed Wilhelm Ludwig Bremen. Pirate loot or legitimate trade? You take your pick. Either way, Serif Osman's power was broken, and rather like in the Flashman novels, he disappeared from history. Which was all useful if your name was James Brooke. The following year, the intrigues in the Brunei court came to a head when the Sultan assassinated several leading claimants for the throne. They just happened to include the pro-British and pro-Brooke, Muda Hashim. Brooke now convinced Cochrane to sail to Brunei to restore order. With this show of force, the Sultan agreed, at Brooke's insistence, to write a letter of apology to Queen Victoria for assassinating his own family. He also signed over the nearby island of Labuan to Britain and agreed not to enter into any treaties without Britain's approval. And lastly, he agreed that Brooke would no longer send him any tribute. So, to all intents and purposes, Sarawak and its white Raja were a sovereign state, a fact that the USA recognised four years later. James Brooke returned to England a hero. Knighted, Sir James was invited to tea with Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle, given the freedom of the City of London and an honorary degree from Oxford University. But in 1849, the pirates on the Sarabas and Scrang rivers reverted to their old ways, raiding undefended villages along the coast. 
Once more, James Brooke requested Royal Naval assistance. And once more, it was forthcoming. This time in the form of Captain Arthur Farquhar. 33-year-old Farquhar had joined the Royal Navy in 1829 and had seen action during the bombardment of Acre during the Oriental Crisis in 1840. Arriving on HMS Albatross, he was also accompanied by the East India Company steamer, the Nemesis. Brooke and Farquhar now set out to destroy the pirates. On the evening of the 30th of July, 1849, they sighted a huge fleet of 120 prowls, large and small, crewed by maybe 4,000 men, lying off the village of Betting Maru. The nemesis sailed to within 30 yards before opening fire with canister shot. Meanwhile, rockets and shells rained down on the wooden village behind them. It was carnage. Trapped between the Royal Navy, a sandbar and the jungle behind, over 90 vessels were destroyed. And as dawn rose, the bay was a mass of wrecked vessels, debris and bodies. Ashore, the village was a burning ruin. It was estimated that 400 pirates had been killed. But considering the size of the fleet and the number of civilians in the village, the figure may have been much higher. Back in Britain, the news provoked mixed reactions from celebration to consternation. Radical MP Richard Cobden pointed out in the House of Commons that Brooke's loss of just 13 men felt like a very one-sided battle in which the opposing force were, quote, annihilated by the hundred in the most inhumane manner, unquote. Equally worrying for some was also the huge bounty that the Royal Navy officers were expecting as their prize. An Act of Parliament back in the 1820s had, as part of Britain's anti-slavery drive, offered a bounty of £20 per head for slave traders captured or killed. And as the Borneo pirates could be classified as slave traders, and the Royal Navy officers just killed 400 of them, that was a lot of money due to the Royal Navy officers. More importantly, they questioned, what evidence did Brooke actually have that this fleet of ships was a pirate fleet, rather than simply merchant vessels at anchor? Exactly who, they asked, were the real pirates. Cobden's calls, supported by William Gladstone, for a parliamentary inquiry were voted down. But the furore wouldn't die away. Eventually an inquiry was held, but in Singapore rather than London. It vindicated Brooke's actions, and indeed his fight against the Borneo pirates. In 1863, Brooke finally convinced the British government to recognise Sarawak as an independent state with Brooke, the White Raja, as its head of state. Worn out by his fights with the pirates, along with attempts to clear his name, and bouts of smallpox and malaria, he died in 1868, age 65. His Royal Navy counterparts all outlived him. Admiral Sir Thomas Cochrane died in 1873, aged 83. After his exploits in Borneo, Henry Keppel went on to lead the Naval Brigade during the Siege of Balaclava in the Crimean War. He ended his career as Commander-in-Chief Plymouth. Admiral Sir Henry Keppel died in 1904, at the grand old age of 94. Oh, and by the way, he is the great-great-great-great-uncle of Queen Camilla. Captain Arthur Farquhar would also rise to the rank of Admiral, and also Commander-in-Chief Plymouth. He died aged 93 in 1908. The Brooke family of White Rogers would rule Sarawak for nearly 100 years. James Brooke was succeeded by his nephew, Charles Johnson, who took on the surname Brooke. Upon his death in 1917, he was succeeded by his son, also a Charles. Following the occupation by the Japanese during the Second World War, Charles Brooke asked Britain to take over Sarawak as a crown colony in 1946. Despite local opposition, the proposal was narrowly passed in the Legislative Council. In 1963, Sarawak became part of Malaysia, and remains so to this day. Well, I hope you enjoyed that story. Why not watch another one of my videos now, such as the one about Admiral Lord Cochrane, the inspiration for Master and Commander? You can also support my show by becoming a member or a patron. There are links below and in the description. Thanks for joining me today. Keep well and I'll see you again very soon.